Thank you. Well, thank you, Mrs. Bowler, and thank you, ladies and gentlemen. It was pretty depressing listening to those previous speakers. In fact, I'm amazed that I see smiles on anyone's faces. It is, yes, very depressing story. America is in serious trouble, and I'm going to be talking today about how we got that way, and then at the very end, what we can do about it. So let's get on with the real story. I think the good place to begin is by telling you a little apocryphal story about uh, show and tell day in the uh, first grade in school. Uh, the teacher had told the children to bring something to class that was interesting and new so they could stand up and show it to the class and tell them all about it. So they all did, most of them brought toys, but uh, little Johnny brought a kitten. Well, naturally, the kitten was more interesting in the long run than most of the toys, so it didn't take long before the whole class was focused on the kitten. And the question came up, was this a boy kitten or a girl kitten? Well, there was a heated discussion on this. Everybody had an opinion, but nobody really knew how to answer the question. So it was just opinions, 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 until finally the teacher asked the class, uh, does anybody know how you can tell the difference between a boy kitten and a girl kitten? And uh, silence fell across the classroom. No one had a clue. And finally Johnny raised his hand. He says, I know. The teacher got very concerned with that one and she asked cautiously, says, well, Johnny, how can you tell? Tell the class. He said, well, my dad says we live in a democracy. And so, in a democracy, you vote on everything, so let's vote on this issue and we'll find out the truth. <laughs> so you know right away this was an American school because it's true, isn't it, that uh, all of us, certainly myself included, have been taught from a very early age that we live in a democracy. It's one of those words that we need to get very serious about defining, but we get this general impression that democracy means a majority rule and that's wonderful. So the majority should decide everything. And the more serious the issue, then the more need there is to have the majority uh, you know, express its view. Well, the purpose of my presentation is a little bit upstream. I'm going to be saying, basically, that this, although it's a cherished American concept, it's a very dangerous one. If you don't think it through and don't put limitations on it, it's a very dangerous concept. And as a matter of fact, it is the concept that is being used against the American people and people all over the world to their own detriment, to put them, in fact, into a condition of bondage, a condition in which they elect their own dictators and feel happy about it because they did it to themselves. That's what I'm going to be talking about. Now, as you probably know, the title of this presentation is called The Quigley Formula. So let's take a look at that. What is this thing, the Quigley Formula? And the first step is to answer the question, who is this man, Quigley? Now, I say this man, Quigley, because the name is Carol Quigley, and sometimes people think that's a woman. Well, it's not. It's Carol Quigley that we're talking about, who was, he's deceased now, but he was a very well-known professor of history who taught at Georgetown University. And while he was there, he had a very famous student by the name of William Clinton. And Clinton studied under Quigley and became a favored student and spent some personal time with him and admired Quigley. 27 years later, when this student was given the nomination for President of the United States, in his acceptance speech, he mentioned Professor Carol Quigley in his speech and paid homage to him. After he was elected President of the United States, he made at least two public appearances of which I'm aware, where again, he mentioned Professor Carol Quigley and thanked him for the influence 
that this man had had on the political awareness and thinking of himself, President Clinton. So there was no question about it that, that Quigley was Clinton's mentor. Now why is this significant? It's significant because Professor Quigley taught the conspiratorial view of history as explained by the conspirators themselves. Quigley was very close to a secret society. In fact, he had been invited, he said in his own works, he had been invited into its inner circle and given the privilege of examining the society's private papers. He was considered to be the official historian of this secret society and he admired it. He thought it was wonderful. He felt privileged to be close to it and to its documents. And he wrote a couple of books about this, as a matter of fact. And he said the only point of disagreement that he had with this secret organization was that it wished to remain hidden from view. He felt that by now, with all these years of success and movement, it was time to come forward and to boast about what it had accomplished and to proclaim openly what its goals were. So Quigley was the historian of a secret society. Now that means therefore that when President Clinton gave homage to Professor Quigley, his comments had two meanings. To the average person who did not know who Quigley was or what position he held or what he had written about, they thought, oh, well, isn't that nice? Here's uh, Bill Clinton giving homage to some nice old professor that had an influence on his collegiate days. How nice. But to those who knew, to those who knew who Quigley was and what his position was and what he wrote about and what he advocated, and we'll be talking a lot about that today, then they understood there was another message, a hidden message. Clinton was saying he knew about this conspiracy and he was now in its service. That was a signal to everyone around the world who understood what the real meaning was. They knew that Clinton now was in the service of this secret society that we'll be talking about today. Now, I've mentioned the word conspiracy before. I'll probably be using it again several times today. And that causes some concern for a lot of people because it's kind of a knee-jerk reaction for people to say, oh, you believe in conspiracy? What are you, a, a conspiracy theorist of some kind? Well, I'm certainly not a conspiracy theorist. Uh, when people take that position, I have to laugh because I feel sorry for them. They've obviously never read a history book. Because anyone who knows anything about history knows that it's built on conspiracies from one end to the other. Conspiracy is the engine of history. Every major event in history, when you examine it, has come to pass largely as a result of at least one, and in many cases, many conspiracies. And it goes on today. These people have never sat in a courtroom and listened to lawyers try men and corporations on the charge of conspiracies. Conspiracies in corporations, conspiracies in families, conspiracies from top to bottom. Conspiracies are a fact of life. And for anybody to say that conspiracies are uh, absurd and that anyone who thinks that conspiracies are real is a conspiracy theorist has a real problem. I do not have this problem. I know the conspiracies are real, and we'll be talking about a very real conspiracy today, and we'll document it with the words of the people themselves who are involved in it, and they're very proud of it. So, but let's not drop the word with that. What is a conspiracy? The dictionary defines conspiracies generally as having three components. If you have three, these three components, then you're dealing with a conspiracy. First, it has to involve two or more people. 
Secondly, it has to use tactics that are either uh, immoral or at least coercion. And thirdly, the objective of these tactics has to be illegal or immoral. All right, that's generally the definition of a conspiracy. So let's take a look before we get into the details of the conspiracy we'll be talking about today and just look at the surface. First of all, will there be two or more people involved? And you bet there are many people involved. Certainly not the masses, but a lot more than two. So we can check that one off. The second part is, do they use deception or coercion? And yes, indeed, they boast about it, as a matter of fact, saying that the masses are so stupid that you have to fool them for their own good. And you have to pass laws to use coercion in order to force people to do what they want. So yes, you can check that one off. They do use deception and coercion. But now we come to the third issue. Is the objective illegal or immoral? Well, it's certainly not illegal in most cases because we'll find out in a moment, as you folks already know, these are the people that make the laws. So what they're doing is entirely legal because they made it legal. They hold the powers of political power, legislative power, executive power, judicial power. And so what they're doing is not illegal. If they're going to merge, let's say, merge the United States or let's say get rid of the United States and merge what is left of it with Mexico and Canada in a North American Union, for example, that's one of many things we could talk about, it will be done entirely legally. It will be done with no objection from Congress. The courts will uphold it. And they'll figure out all kinds of ways to justify it as a legal move. So it's not illegal in most cases, although sometimes they do resort to illegal measures, but that's very rare. That leaves finally the last issue. Is it immoral or unethical? Now in the minds of these people, it is the highest morality. They think that their goal is the highest morality possible. They are working towards what they fondly call the new world order. In their minds, that is the ultimate morality. And it's people like you and me who are the immoral ones, the idiots that think that national sovereignty has some kind of value in this modern world. We are the ones standing in the way of progress. We are the ones standing in the way of the happiness of mankind. We are the ones that are for, for all kinds of uh, injustice. We are the ones that are immoral, you see. So in their minds, they're very moral in everything they do. And the end justifies the means. If they have to sacrifice individuals or minorities or large numbers of people to achieve this wonderful goal, it's an act of honor. It's an act of high ethics. So in their mind, they are not conspirators because we fail to have all three of these elements. They are not conspirators in their mind. But now in the minds of the rest of us who have to live in this order that they are forcing upon us through coercion and deception, I think we have every reason to consider that the objective is unethical and is immoral and is disastrous to the American people and to people everywhere in the world. So I think for us to use the word conspiracy is entirely justified. Now having gotten that out of the way, let's get down to the substance of what this conspiracy really is. Professor Quigley described this conspiracy in two books. One is called Tragedy and Hope, and the other is The Anglo-American Establishment. Tragedy and Hope in particular is a very thick book. They're both history books. They're written by a history professor. They're both pretty dry. They're hard to read. You get a lot of dull, factual information, names, dates, places, events, and so forth, and it's easy to go to sleep reading these books. But the, all of a sudden, you'll come across a paragraph or a sentence that'll just blow your socks off. And you'll go back and say, did he really say that? And indeed he did. Remember, he's the historian of this group. These books were not written for mass consumption. They were written primarily for academia and for people who were involved in this conspiracy at one level or another, who were curious to know about its origins, about its history, and about 
the extent of its operations in the world today. It was written for that very select group, and it was only accidental that uh, people like myself and some others got hold of copies of it and began to talk about it, and the word got out, and uh, first thing you know, a lot of people who weren't intended to read it started to read it and become alarmed about it, and so the publisher, which was Macmillan and Company, pulled it. They said, no, we're not going to reprint this book anymore. Professor Quigley himself, by the way, was very irate at that. He, uh, he, was, uh, he started a lawsuit, as a matter of fact, against Macmillan, but uh, this is another story. There was at least one publisher in uh, California that started to pirate the copies. He made a beautiful replica of it. You could hardly tell the difference between the original and this. He sold thousands and thousands of copies. And it, it was embarrassing for Macmillan to say, well, we've got to stop him from doing that because they were at the, at the same time saying there's no market for it. <laughs> and so Macmillan finally relented and put the book back into print. Well, anyway, if you can buy a copy of it today, either the pirated version, which I think is more valuable because it's more limited edition, <laughs> or you can buy the original thing from Macmillan. That's another side issue. The important question here is what did these books say? I'm going to give you an overview of my summary of it, and then I'm going to come back and give you excerpts from the books themselves to illustrate that my summary is accurate. Otherwise, you may wonder, uh, Quigley didn't really say those things. But here's my summary so you can get the whole picture first, and then we'll look at the details. Quigley said that at the end of the 19th century, a secret society was formed in England by Cecil Rhodes. Now, as many people know, Cecil Rhodes was uh, one of the wealthiest men of history of all time. He was the chancellor of South Africa. He had acquired uh, possession of almost all of the gold mines and diamond mines in South Africa and had used this tremendous uh, access to the natural resources of that country primarily for his own personal use. Very wealthy person. What we don't know generally is how he used that money. Most people think that, well, it probably went to his heirs. It did not. Cecil Rhodes created seven wills and very specifically instructed uh, his executors of how to dispose of and use this great wealth. And he said it should be used for the purpose of creating a secret society. And that's how it was, and still is, by the way, being used. Now, one of the wills created the Rhodes Scholarship. We all heard about that. And the general impression there is that isn't it wonderful that this man Rhodes set aside a big chunk of money for the education of worthy young men and women? Well, that's kind of a surface view. He did set aside a big chunk of money for the education of worthy young men and women, but the definition of worthy meant that they had to have a certain worldview. They had to be smart. They had to believe in global government based on the model of collectivism. They had to be a little bit ruthless. And they had to be capable of being enlisted into the secret society. This was the recruiting arm of the secret society to a large extent. It was a recruiting fund, not an educational fund. The other wills are unknown completely to most people. They have no idea what that money was used for and how it was allocated in these other wills. I said uh, seven wills before. Actually, that was a mistake. It was five wills. He wrote five wills. And the scholarship fund became the best known of them, and the others are pretty much even unknown to this day. This secret society exists today continues to exist, and has been a major historical force since World War I. Quigley says that every major event in history from World War I has been dominated and directed to a large extent by this secret society. The goal of this organization originally was to expand the British Empire's culture and political system and domination over the entire world, originally. Rhodes felt that the English uh, 
represented the finest, uh, the highest watermark in culture, was the finest race in the world, the smartest people, the most benevolent people, and uh, they had an obligation, you see, to rule the world so that all of the ignorant people of the world could benefit from this. It was an act of noblesse noblesse. They had this obligation. Somebody had to do it to protect these poor, ignorant people from themselves. It might as well be them, since they had this wonderful culture, this great language, and this great outlook of what the future should be, a world built on the model of collectivism. Now that evolved very quickly after Cecil Rhodes' death to a different view. It was no longer the British Empire that was to be at the center, but there was a world government to be created. The geographical axis shifted from London to New York and became the United Nations, but nevertheless the original concept that the members of the secret society would rule from behind the scenes. They would not be the major political figures. They would be the ones who selected the major political figures and who funded the major political figures. They would not be the great teachers or the uh, historians who wrote the textbooks. They would be the ones who hired the great teachers and funded the historians who wrote the textbooks. They would always work behind the scenes. That was the, the model that he set up. The method by which they would do this was very precise. They knew that you could not really control the masses directly one-on-one. -on -one. You had to do it through the organizations to which they belonged. They called them the power centers of society. Man has a herd instinct. We belong to groups. We follow leaders. We move in groups. We sometimes even think in groups. And so they recognized a long time ago that all you had to do if you wanted to lead the masses is to capture control of the groups, the leadership of the groups to which people belonged, the political parties, church organizations, labor unions, media outlets, great corporations, all of the groups, the power centers of society, you could control them with a relatively small number of people if they were well organized, dedicated, and funded. And then those people would indirectly control the world. That was the model. The structure that Cecil Rhodes created, and remember this is all described primarily by Professor Quigley, was out outwardly modeled after the Jesuit order. That's right. I was surprised to read that. The Jesuit order? Quigley was a great admirer of the structure of the Jesuits, and he decided to model his secret society after that structure. But at the deeper level, it was clear that he borrowed the structure from the Illuminati. And now everyone knows that the Illuminati existed at one time, was created in 1776 by Adam Weishaupt, but shortly thereafter it was exposed in Bavaria. Uh, the police raided it, they arrested its members, they discovered its, its uh, ledgers and its books and its papers, which is why we know so much about them. They're part of the public record now. We know what the Illuminati was trying to do and how they were structured and how they organized and so forth. And so that's part of the record, but we are told that the Illuminati ceased to exist after that date. I think it probably did, but whether it did or not, certainly others like Cecil Rhodes picked it up. They picked up the concept. I don't know if there's a historical continuity back to Adam Weishaupt. I don't think it makes an awful lot of difference when we realize that there are people like Cecil Rhodes who read Adam Weishaupt's work and said, hey, this is a good idea. Let's use it. And that's basically what Cecil Rhodes did. He adopted the strategy that Weishaupt created of he called it rings within rings within rings. That means that the center of the secret society would be run by one individual with perhaps a little brain trust around him of two or three people. They would be the absolute rulers of this whole structure. Then they would create around them a ring, as they called it, a larger organization 
which they would dominate. They would control it absolutely from the center. But the other members who were recruited into this larger organization would not be allowed to know that there was an inner control and direction. They were brought in for a lesser a view of the whole purpose. And that was the outer ring, and that might be 20, 30, 50 people, maybe 100 people. And then outside of that, there would be a larger ring, another organization created with hundreds of people, perhaps thousands of people. And they would not be allowed to know, or would they even suspect, that there was an inner ring controlling the larger outer ring. And this is what Weissop called rings within rings within rings. Cecil Rhodes thought that was a dandy idea, and so he adopted it as the structure for his secret society. Now in his group, the inner circle, they called the Society of the Elect. That was the name Rhodes put to it. It originally consisted of Cecil Rhodes and a brain trust from British banking and politics. A very small number of highly placed, very wealthy people. The center of gravity, as I mentioned a moment ago, shifted eventually to the Rockefeller Group in the United States with centers of influence in such other organizations as the Bilderberg Group, the Trilateral Commission, and that sort of thing. We've all heard about these. And the goal shifted away from the control from the British Empire to a international control through something called the New World Order, is the phrase they adopted, with control primarily focused in New York, with the United Nations meant to be the hub of this global government. And I should say global government, not just any global government, but one based on the model of collectivism, which means total control over every human being. Not much room left there for personal freedom. Now, the secondary rings around the society of the elect were called round tables. And they were formed in the United States, in Britain, and all of the former British dependencies. And they still exist today. They operate under that name. Around the round tables, a larger ring, a tertiary ring, was formed, and they called them front groups in a generic sense, in each country where there were round tables. And they took on the name in the dependencies of the former dependencies of the British Empire, they took on the name of Royal Institute for International Affairs. That's where you'll find them today under that name in all of the countries Great Britain, Canada, Australia, and so forth. The Royal Institute of International Affairs. But in the United States, the word royal didn't go over too well. And so they changed it completely, and they called it the Council on Foreign Relations. But it has exactly the same relationship to the roundtables, which is surrounding the Society of the Elect, which is the secret society that still functions today, was created by Cecil Rhodes. And ladies and gentlemen, after a 100 years of operation and of penetration, into the power centers of society. The Rhodesian network, as I call it, now is close to its final achievement, which is its goal, the creation of a true new world order. Now, I call it the Rhodesian network because one of the things we have to realize is that itself, it has no name. Isn't that brilliant? Quigley, when he writes about it, doesn't know whether to call it the group or the network, or the Rhodes, or the Rhodes Group. He calls it all these different things. And you see, they, ca they uh, carefully and consciously decided not to have an official name. Well, if you don't have a name, it's pretty hard to talk about a structure like that. So that was one of the very smart moves they made, did not have an official name. I have given it a name, so I can talk about it. I call it the Rhodesian Group, or the Rhodesian Network, the Rhodesians. I hope it sticks, because that's exactly what they are. Now, I said that this group is dominant now, is coming close to fruition of its ultimate goal in the Western world. I very carefully said the Western world, because I wanted to differentiate between what's going on in the Western world and what's going on in the rest of the world. We tend to think, as we look at this group, that this is the totality of our problem in the world today, and it is not. 
there is at least one other group very similar to the Rhodesians. They too decided that having a name was a bad idea, and not too long ago they got rid of their name. We used to call them communists. Well, they said, we don't want that name. Nobody likes that name. Let's get rid of it. And so they're no longer communists. They went through this great uh, charade of getting rid of the communist empire. All they did was change their names, ladies and gentlemen. They don't really have a name anymore. They took this hat that said communist on the front of it, and they turn it around, and the other side it said social democrat. Now that's different, isn't it? <laughs> social democrat. But you notice the heads under the hat were the same. They didn't change the heads, unless they died off. But most of the old commissars are now uh, uh, entrepreneurs, and they're still running the country, and they still believe in collectivism, and they still are the enemies of freedom, and they still operate a military that it could potentially be a very big threat someday. They still operate a secret service. The former KGB has changed its name, but it's bigger and more powerful than ever before. And they're still dominant in a huge part of the world. We must not forget that they live, they're there, and they're very similar to the Rhodesians. As a matter of fact, their ultimate goal of world government based on the model of collectivism is exactly the same. There is no difference between the ultimate goals of these two groups. The only difference is that they compete with each other for dominance in this new world order. They'll fight tooth and nail for territory and dominance and control. But their goal is exactly the same. And I just want to footnote that into my comments today because it's extremely important that we don't think that just because we have this problem with the Rhodesians, that anybody out there who condemns the Rhodesians for their faults are good guys. I mean, we don't want to run to the, to the Leninists now and say, well, because they're opposed to the Rhodesians, the Leninists have got to be good. No. It's going from, you know, pot into the fire, frying pan into the fire. They're both exactly the same. All right. Now, that is my summary of what Quigley said and others. Let's go now to the actual documents and see if perhaps I distorted or exaggerated in some way. Let's go to Tragedy and Hope, Quigley's mammoth book. And this is what he said. He said, I know of the operation of this network because I have studied it for 20 years and was permitted for two years during the 1960s to examine its papers and secret records. I have no aversion to it or to most of its aims and have for much of my life been close to it and to many of its instruments. In general, my chief difference of opinion is that it wishes to remain unknown. So there's Quigley's appraisal of the secret society, and he likes it a lot. In his other book, The Anglo-American Establishment, this is what he said. The Rhodes Scholarship established by the terms of Cecil Rhodes' seventh will, oh, we're back to seven again, I've got to get my numbers right, seventh will. The Rhodes Scholarship established by the terms of Cecil Rhodes' seventh will are known to everyone. What is not so widely known is that Rhodes, in five previous wills, left his fortune to form a secret society which was to devote itself to the preservation and expansion of the British Empire. And what does not seem to be known to anyone is that this secret society continues to exist to this day. To be sure, it is not a childish thing like the Ku Klux Klan, and it does not have any secret robes, secret hand clasps, or secret passwords. It, does, it doesn't need any of these things since its members know each other intimately. It probably has no oaths of secrecy nor any formal procedure of initiation. The, it does, however, exist, and it holds secret meetings. This group is, as I shall show, one of the most important historical facts of the 20th century. Now, when he says secret meetings, I want you just to think in terms of the Bilderberg meetings. There's nothing more secret than that. This is what he's talking about. And the, G, you know, the, the countries that uh, dominate the central banks, they have the G5 or the G7 they meet. That's very secret. Trilateral commission meetings are secret. That's what he's talking about. Now, one of the original leaders of this organization was uh, William Stead. 
and he wrote a book called The Last Will and Testament of Cecil Rhodes. He was uh, well positioned to write that book because he was the executor of Cecil Rhodes' estate. Okay, so this guy knows what he's talking about. In this book, Stead wrote this. He said, Mr. Rhodes was more than the founder of a dynasty. He aspired to be the creator of one of the vast semi-religious quasi-political associations which, like the Society of Jesus, have played so large a part in the history of the world. To be more strictly accurate, he wished to found an order as the instrument of the will of the dynasty. An order, like a religious order or like a chivalric order. That was the intensity of the loyalty and commitment that Cecil Rhodes envisioned and acquired. Cecil Rhodes uh, left some handwritten manuscripts upon his death, and they weren't published until quite a bit later. But in one of those, this is what he wrote. Now this is from the words of the man himself. He said, I contend that we English are the finest race in the world in that, the, uh, that most of the world that we inhabit, it, it is better because we are the supreme masters of the human race. Now I want to get this straight. I didn't read that quite right, so let me read it again. I consider that we English are the finest race in the world and that the more of the world we inhabit, the better it is for the human race. What scheme could we think of to forward this object? I look into history and I read the story of the Jesuits. I see that what they were able to do in a bad cause, and I might say uh, under bad leaders. In the present day I became a member of the Masonic Order. I see the wealth and power they possess, the influence they hold. And I think over their ceremonies, and I wonder that a large body of men can devote themselves to what at times appear the most ridiculous and absurd rites without an ob object and without an end. The idea, gleaming and dancing before one's eyes, like a will-o'-the-wisp, at last frames itself into a plan. Why should we not form a secret society with but one object, the furtherance of the British Empire, and the bringing of the whole uncivilized world under British rule. That was his vision in his own words. Now back to Quigley's words. He said that the goal of this secret society was, and I quote, nothing less than to create a world system of financial control in private hands able to dominate the political systems of each country and the economy of the world as a whole. The system was to be controlled in a feudalist fashion by the central banks of the world, acting in concert by secret agreements arrived at in frequent private meetings and conferences." End quote. On page four of the Anglo-American establishment, Quigley says this, this organization has been able to conceal its existence quite successfully and many of its most influential members satisfied to possess the reality rather than the appearance of power are unknown even to close students of British history, partly because of the deliberate policy of secrecy which this group has adopted and partly because the group itself is not closely integrated but rather appears as a series of overlapping circles or rings partly concealed by being hidden behind formally organized groups of no obvious political significance. Now regarding the conspiratorial structure of this group, Quigley tells us this. He says, in the secret society, Rhodes was to be leader, Stead, he's the guy that wrote the book on the wills, Stead, Brett, Lord Escher, and Milner were to form an executive committee called the Society of the Elect. Arthur, Lord Balfour, Sir Harry Johnston, Lord Rothschild, Albert, Lord Grey, and the others were listed as potential members of a circle of initiates, while there was to be an outer circle known as the Association of Helpers, later organized by Milner as the Roundtable Organization. 
After the death of Cecil Rhodes, the organization fell under the control of Lord Alfred Milner, who recruited young men from the upper class of society to become part of the Association of Helpers. All right, a lot of words in there, but what that boils down to is this. These young men that were recruited were unofficially referred to at that time by this group as Milner's Kindergarten. Now, they were college graduates. They came out of the finest universities in England, and they went into top positions in government and elsewhere. But they called them Milner's Kindergarten, nevertheless. These were the men who were placed into the power centers of British society. Eventually, they became the round tables in all of these countries, which were the inner rings of the larger front groups. Milner's kindergarten became the round tables. Now, we must remember that the purpose of a secret society is deceit. They have to have secrets, don't they? They're not going to reveal their secrets. Otherwise, you don't need a secret society. You can just do everything out in the open. So if you have to guard secrets and people ask you to explain what it is you're doing, you cannot say, well, we're doing this, this, and this. You have to lie about it. That's just logic. And so we find a lot of this going on. These, the members of this secret organization lie. They lie through their teeth, and they think it's an honorable thing to do because they're preserving the secret. It's not a lie to them. It's just a, a necessary public relations gesture. And, you know, you find this throughout, but there's a classic example I would like to share with you. Uh, one of the uh, most, or the better known of these people, uh, one of the more prominent members of Milner's Kindergarten, which we discussed a moment ago, his name was Arnold Toynbee. Now, he's a very famous historian, isn't he? Everybody's heard of Arnold Toynbee, a renowned historian, he's a professor at the London School of Economics, where they teach collectivism, global government. He was the director of studies at the Royal Institute of International Affairs, which was a front group for the round table. He was a British intelligence agent and the author of a 12 volume work called A Study of History, which extols the virtue of world government based on the model of collectivism. And in November 1931, in that issue of the International Affairs publication, which was the official publication of this front group, this round table, which was uh, to be read primarily uh, by, only by its members, it wasn't to be read by people like us, where they can lower their guard and speak the truth, not expecting anybody to really catch it. This is what he said. Toynbee said, I will hereby repeat that we are at present working discreetly but with all of our might to wrest this mysterious political force called sovereignty out of the clutches of the local national states of our world. And all the time we are denying with our lips what we are doing with our hands. Good for us. See, this is what you would expect from a secret society. It should not be a shock to anybody. But I put it in because some people still find it hard to believe that their politicians or anybody in prominence would not tell the truth. Now, world government doesn't just happen by writing articles or books. You know, it happens only when people come into control of the power centers of society and drive society into world government. And Quigley explains how this came about. He said, and I quote, Through Lord Milner's influence, these men were able to win influential posts in government, in international finance, and become the dominant influence in British imperial affairs and foreign affairs up to 1939. In 1909 through 1913, they uh, organized semi-secret groups known as roundtable groups in the chief British dependencies and in the United States. These still function in eight countries. The task was given to Lionel Curtis, who established in England and each dominion a front organization to the existing local roundtable group. This front organization, called the Royal Institute of International Affairs, had as its nucleus in each area the existing submerged roundtable group. In New York, it was known as the Council on Foreign Relations and was a front for J.P. Morgan and Company. 
I hope you were awake and heard all of that. Because what we just learned from Quigley himself, we come to the ubiquitous Council on Foreign Relations, which was mentioned by several of your speakers uh, earlier today, and who those people are, what influence they have. Where did this organization come from? Now we know. But we're informed it was spawned by a secret society, which still exists today, that it is a front for a roundtable group, originally embodied in J.P. Morgan and Company, but now the Rockefeller Consortium, and that its primary goal is no longer the expansion of the British Empire, but global collectivism with control in private hands administered in a feudalist fashion by the central banks of the world. Now, ladies and gentlemen, these are their words, not mine. Now, why is this important? It's important because the members of the Council on Foreign Relations are the rulers of America. Who are they? Well, once in a while their name pops into the news, but very seldom you get them all together. I'm going to take a few moments. This might be boring, but I think for the record, everyone needs to be familiar with the names, some of the prominent names, who are members of this outer ring of a secret society. Let's start with the presidents of the United States. Herbert Hoover, Dwight Eisenhower, Richard Nixon, Gerald Ford, James Carter, George Bush Sr., and William Clinton. JFK once said that he was a member of the CFR, but nowhere can you find him on the membership rolls. So I guess he was a wannabe, but didn't quite make it in. But he actually said that he thought he was a member. And of course, the presidential candidates, John Kerry and Vice President Richard Cheney, are members of the CFR. Secretaries of State. This is a very important position for this group because it's even more important than the president. The president can be controlled by the Secretary of State, Secretary of Defense, and all of his cabinet members who are pretty much appointed for him. You know, he doesn't appoint, presidents don't appoint their cabinet members from their own private telephone directory, you know. They're, they're not even in their book. They're told who to appoint. Anyway, here are the secretaries of state, perhaps the most important position in the United States government as far as the CFR is concerned. Dean Rusk, Robert Lansing, Frank Kellogg, Henry Stimson, Cordell Hull, E.R. Statinius, George Marshall, Dean Acheson, John Foster Dulles, Christian Herter, Dean Rusk, William Rogers, Henry Kissinger, Cyrus Vance, Edmund Muskie, Alexander Haig, George Schultz, James Baker, Lawrence Igelberger, Warren Christopher, William Richardson, Madeleine Albright, Colin Powell, and of course, Condoleezza Rice. Did we leave anybody out? I don't think so. Now, Secretaries of Defense, also very important. James Forrestal, George Marshall, Charles Wilson, Neil McElroy, Robert McNamara, Melvin Laird, Elliot Richardson, James Schlesinger, Harold Brown, Casper Weinberger, Frank Colucci, Richard Cheney, Les Aspen, William Perry, William Cohen, and Donald Rumsfeld. Directors of the CIA, pretty important. Walter Smith, William Colby, Richard Helms, Alan Dulles, John McCone, James Schlesinger, George Bush Sr., Stansfield Turner, William Casey, William Webster, Robert Gates, James Woolsey, John Deutsch, William Studdeman, George Tennant, Porter Goss, and Michael Hayden. Now some better known corporations with CFR members at the board of directors or chief executive levels, where they dominate these huge corporations. It's quite a list. I had to trim this down, believe it or not. Here are just a few. Atlantic Richfield Oil Company, AT&T, Avon Products, Bechtel Construction Group, Boeing Company, Bristol Myers Squibb, Chevron, Coca-Cola and Pepsi-Cola, Consolidated Edison of New York, Exxon, Dow Chemical, DuPont Chemical, Eastman Kodak, Enron, Estee Lauder, Ford Motor, General Electric, General Foods, Hewlett Packard, Hughes Aircraft, IBM, International Paper, Johnson & Johnson, Levi Strauss & Company, 
Lockheed Aerospace, Lucent Technologies, Mobile Oil, Monsanto, Northrop, Pacific Gas and Electric, Phillips Petroleum, Procter & Gamble, Quaker Oats, SBC Yahoo, Shell Oil, Smith Klein Beecham Pharmaceuticals, Sprint Corporation, Texaco, Santa Fe Southern Pacific Railroad, Teledyne, TRW, Southern California Edison, Unical, United Technologies, Verizon Communications, Warner Lambert, Weyerhaeuser, and Xerox, to mention just a few. Now in the media, also very important in controlling the thinking processes of the American people. We find CFR members in the management and operational positions at the Army Times, Associated Press, Association of American Publishers, Barron's, Boston Globe, Business Week, Christian Science Monitor, Dallas Morning News, Detroit Free Press, Detroit News, USA Today, Wall Street Journal, Los Angeles Times, New York Post, San Diego Union Tribune, Times Mirror, Random House, W.W. Norton and Company, Warner Books, American Spectator, Atlantic, Harper's Farm Journal, Financial World, Insight, Washington Times, Medical Tribune, National Geographic, National Review, New Republic, New Yorker, Newsday, Newsmax, Newsweek, Pittsburgh Post-Gazette, Reader's Digest, Rolling Stone, Scientific American, Times Warner, Time, U.S. News and World Report, Washington Post, ABC, CBS, CNN, NBC, PBS, RCA, The Walt Disney Company, and of course, Rupert Murdoch. Media personalities, the talking heads, include David Brinkley, Tom Brokaw, William Buckley, Peter Jennings, Bill Moyers, Dan Rather, Diane Sawyer, Barbara Walters, Katie Couric, and Andrea Mitchell, who's the wife of Alan Greenspan, former chairman of the Federal Reserve System. Of course, Alan is a member of the Council on Foreign Relations. Labor unions and C with CFR members in key positions include AFL-CIO, United Steelworkers of America, United Auto Workers, American Federation of Teachers, Bricklayers and Allied Craft, Communication Workers of America, Union of Needle Trades, and Amalgamated Clothing and Textile Workers. All the big ones. In the tax-exempt foundations and think tanks, the number of CFR members in controlling positions is 443. Some of the better known names are the Sloan and Kettering Foundation, Aspen Institute, Atlantic Council, Bilderberg Group, Brookings Institute, Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, Carnegie Foundation, Ford Foundation, Guggenheimer Foundation, Hudson Institute, John and Catherine MacArthur Foundation, Mellon Foundation, Rand Corporation, Rhodes Scholarship Selection Commission, Rockefeller Foundation, and Rockefeller Brothers Fund, the Trilateral Commission, and the UN Association. In the universities, the number of CFR members who are or have been professors, department chairmen, presidents, or board members is 563. My last count could be different today, probably more. In the financial institutions such as banks, the Federal Reserve, stock exchanges, and brokerage houses, the number of CFR members with controlling positions is 284. Now, ladies and gentlemen, that gives you an idea. We could go into other areas, but bear in mind that the total membership of this group is about 4,000 people. Now, there are a lot of churches in your hometown that have memberships equal to or larger than that. And wouldn't it be curious if you were to discover that the members of that one church held all of these positions in society? Wouldn't you be curious as to what's going on? But first, you'd have to know about it. And how would you know about it if the channels of communication by which you might be informed of it are also controlled by these same people? You see the magnitude of the problem we face. I'd like to emphasize that the CFR is not the inner core of a secret society. But it's at least two rings out. Now what does that mean? That means that most of those people in the CFR are not aware of the history I'm giving you today. They have no inkling of it. Probably if they did know it, they'd be impressed. <laughs> they wouldn't be shocked because, boy, we're on the inside of a very powerful group. 
Most of these people, I think, look at this as sort of a high-powered ultimate employment agency. They know that if they're invited into this group, and you have to be invited, that they've got it made. Once your name is on that list, you never have to worry about a job again because the New World Order people are constantly looking for reliable servants to their cause. And these people have been selected not because they're evil people at all or because they've got the grand vision of global government, although some of them do, but most of them just go along with the idea. They're open to it. They like it. And so they're dependable. And that's how they get in. So these are not, these people are not, most of them, at the inner core of a secret society. They're just opportunists. Now, there are three things we have to understand about this group. First of all, they're not partisan. The names I read to you have nothing to do with Republicans versus Democrats. You find them equally uh, located in both political parties. These people laugh at anyone who takes seriously a political party. They laugh at all of these people campaigning out there for Republicans or Democrats. This has nothing to do with that. Secondly, they are elitists. They intend to rule for our own good, of course. And thirdly, the method by which they intend to rule is called democracy. We're back to that word. Democracy. They want democracy. Now that presents a problem. How is it possible for these people to rule mankind absolutely and still allow democracy? Where people vote and determine things through the ballot box. There's no problem with that in their book. All they have to do, they say, is just control the elections. Allow people to vote so long as they don't vote for anything significant. We'll make all the important decisions and let them vote for the unimportant things so they get the sensation of participating in their own political destiny. They'll be happy. Just keep them out of the way. Let them have their fun and games. Let them have their bumper stickers and their, and their straw hats. Let them go to the convention and let them fight with each other out there. Candidate against candidate, but we own them all. So what difference does it make? You see? You're getting the picture. Now, Quigley himself described this in very approving terms. He likes that idea. In his book, this is what he says. This is in, uh, I've forgotten which book it is now, but it's right, let's see, it's probably the big thick one. Here's what he said. The national parties and their presidential candidates with the Eastern establishment assiduously fostering the process behind the scenes, moved closer together and nearly met in the center with almost identical candidates and platforms. Although the process was concealed as much as possible by the revival of obsolescent or meaningless war cries and slogans, often going back to the Civil War. The argument that the two parties should represent opposed ideals and policies, one perhaps of the right, and the other of the left, is a foolish idea acceptable only to the doctrinaire and academic thinkers. Instead, the two parties should be almost identical so that the American people can throw the rascals out at any election without leading to any profound or extreme shifts in policy. Either party in office becomes in time corrupt, tired, unenterprising, and vigorless then it should be possible to replace it every four years, if necessary, by the other party, which will be none of these things, but will still pursue with new vigor approximately the same basic policies. And there you have it. Does it sound familiar? Yes. This is the system that we have been living under, ladies and gentlemen, since World War I. Now, what are these basic policies? The creation of the new world order based on the model of collectivism. That's it. Everything else is secondary. You can have fiscal responsibility. You can have wars, no wars. Any, as long as you're moving, moving constantly in that same direction, that's the same basic policy that they demand from all candidates and two of the, the two major political parties. 
hard to put that into focus because we slept through a lot of this. I did. I didn't re even know it was going on for most of my life. So I look back in history and I could see it clearly now that I understand the, the template. And the good place to start was with the Panama Canal. We gave it away, didn't we? Did the American people want that? No. Republicans didn't want it, Democrats didn't want it, the voters didn't, but both parties united and gave away the Panama Canal because that was the goal of the CFR. Republicans call for war in the Middle East and they advocate that we give more power to the UN. The Democrats call for peace in the Middle East and advocate that we give more power to the UN. <laughs> And after the Democrats came to a majority in the last election, we thought, ah, they're going to pull the troops out and have peace in the Middle East. No, no. No, no. No changes, really. They talk a lot about peace, but they continue to fund all of, the, all of Mr. Bush's uh, war measures. They complain a lot. They grumble. They give speeches. But when it comes to the vote, they continue the same policies because that is what the goal is of the Council on Foreign Relations. Republicans promote legislation to restrict rights in the name of anti-terrorism and national security. The Democrats give speeches of deep concern about that and then vote for those laws. The electorate doesn't want that. Republicans or Democrats, voters, they don't want that, but that is the goal of the Council on Foreign Relations. As a matter of fact, almost all of this legislation was written by members of the Council on Foreign Relations long before 9-11. They were just waiting for an excuse to put it into effect. Democrats promote legislation to restrict freedom in the name of stopping global warming. Republicans object and say that's not based on scientific fact and then they vote for those laws. The electorate doesn't want that. Republicans or Democrats, they don't want that, but that is the goal of the Council on Foreign Relations. Republicans advocate laws that will restrict your freedom of speech because it might be seditious and damage national security. Democrats don't like that. They think that's terrible. So what's their answer? They promote legislation to restrict your speech because it might be hate speech. But both of them agree on the right to restrict your speech if they want to do so because that is the goal of the Council on Foreign Relations. The American people don't want that. Republicans give speeches on the danger of illegal immigration. Don't do anything about it, but they give good speeches on it. The Democrats give speeches about compassion, but then they both unite in merging the United States with Canada and Mexico so that the issue of immigration becomes a non-issue. The American people don't want that. The Mexican people don't want that. The Canadian people don't want that. But that is the goal of the CFR. Republican leaders who run corporations that build election or electronic voting machines steal elections using software, using machines that not only are capable of being hacked, but ladies and gentlemen, they were designed to be hacked. And the, Rep and the Democrats so far who have lost these elections, they don't do anything about it, you've noticed. They just say, oh golly, I wonder if the election was stolen. Did Mr. Bush really win that election? And Mr. Kerry and Mr. Gore don't really do anything about it. They block, actually block any serious groundswell of opposition to it. Now that the new elections are on hand, we, sign, we find that the, the rigging of the elections are being used to promote certain Democrats. You see, this has nothing to do with Democrats versus Republicans. This has to do with the Quigley formula. Rigged elections is the ultimate form of the Quigley formula, giving people the illusion that they participated in their own political destiny because by golly they went to the polls and they touched the screen and the light went on and they got their little sticker that says I voted. <laughs> and they have no idea what went on inside that machine when the numbers were counted. Or they get a piece of paper and they put it through a, a scanner and say, oh, I got the piece of paper, see, and it goes into a scanner. They have no idea what goes on inside that scanner and how the numbers come out. That is the ultimate embodiment of the Quigley formula. 
What we're dealing here is a fo with here is a phony wrestling match. I remember my grandmother used to watch these wrestling matches when TV was in its infancy. She'd sit there, smoke her cigarettes, and jump up and down and say, look at that guy, he's, just, he's a bad guy, and he's going to beat up on this other guy. You know, they, they had the tights on, you could always tell the good guys from the bad guys because the bad guys had the masks and the tattoos. It's gotten even worse today, I know, but in those days it was good enough. My grandmother thought that was real. And it was about as phony as a $3 bill. It's, Elections today, ladies and gentlemen, are about the same thing as a rigged wrestling match. They go through and put on a great show in the ring, but when it's all over, they meet in the, in the locker room, put their arms around each other, say, boy, that was a good show you put on there, and they go out and have a beer. Americans have become like tennis balls in a tennis match. Wham! From one side to the other side. Republicans, no, we don't like the Republicans this year. So we vote Democrat. Now they're the good guys, right? Wham! They turn out to be the bad guys. So back we go to the Republicans again. Back and forth, back and forth. And in this game, yeah, the players can sometimes win a game. But we, the tennis balls, never win anything. We've got to stop being tennis balls and realize what's really going on out there. So people don't vote for a candidate so much anymore. They don't like any of them. They're beginning to suspect this whole thing is foul. But they now vote against candidates. They're going to vote for the lesser of two evils. Isn't that smart? And then they wonder how come they got evil. Because they've been voting the lesser of two evils all their lives. They don't like anybody. Well, sometimes they do. But generally, this is the politics of hate. I don't like this candidate, but I hate that one. And we can't let him get into office. And voters are putty in the hands of these, these psychopoliticians who know how to manipulate them. I think the average voter today, trying to figure out who to vote for on the basis of choosing between Republicans or Democrats, he's got about as much chance of figuring out what's going on and making a cor correct decision, in fact, less of a chance, than the children in that classroom trying to determine whether that was a boy kitten or a girl kitten. We haven't a clue. And that's the problem we're facing. All right. I could talk a little bit more about the cheerleaders, Rush Limbaugh, Michael Moore, organizations like Accuracy and Media, organizations like Move On. All of these are cheerleaders. They're cheerleaders for the phony wrestling match. Some of them are very good at exposing the uh, corruption in one party, but they're totally blind to any corruption in the party that they represent. And the others are totally good at exposing the corruption in the other party, but they're totally blind to their assigned uh, loyalty. We've got to get clear on these phony cheerleaders as well. So now we come finally to the solution. What is the solution to this? Silence has fallen across the room here. <laughs> Ask anyone. They'll tell you. There isn't any. Collectivism is one. These people have won. They control the power centers of society. You really think that you're going to break the grip of these people that run the elections, they control the elections, the political parties, the media, they're your employers, uh, they run the military, they have the CIA, uh, they, all, you think you're really going to break the grips of these people? Let's face reality. They've won. We've lost. Those who benefit from it are too happy with it. Those who serve it and are, are subject to it are afraid of it. They don't want to stand up for fear it might be bad for their reputation or business. They're not going to do anything. So it's over. Get used to it. Ah, but wait a minute. I just had an idea. What would happen, do you suppose, if just 2% of the people knew what was really going on and they were no longer willing to play this game? And if just 2% of the, of the people would unite across the, the lines of religion, culture, uh, politics, just unite and have a common creed. They knew what they were for as well as what they're against. They're not voting against something. 
Now, for the first time, they're voting for something, or at least working for something. And if they united and worked together, do you think we could turn this thing around? I think so. I think so, definitely. In fact, I'm betting my life on it and everything I have. It can be done. Now, it might not be done by the next election, so we've got to get this longer view of history. One of our problems is that everybody is impatient. They want it done by the next election. If we can't see it being done then, forget it. No, that's not how it works. It took these people a hundred years to get to where they are today. You think we're going to turn that around in, in six months or a year? Not going to happen. Even if our favorite candidate were to be elected president and he moved into the White House, he would be surrounded by enemies, collectivists, he completely surrounded, it would block him in every way. In order for us to solve this problem, we have to send people into government at all levels, not just one candidate. And we have to have all of these people on the same page, knowing what they stand for, having a creed of freedom. Then it can be done. And that's the reason that we created Freedom Force International a few years ago. And I'm here to tell you, it's going like wildfire. We now have members, as of we speak, in 55 different countries. I never thought that would happen, but I knew it had to happen, and it's growing. People who are dedicated to recapture control of the power centers of society, take our systems back just the way we lost them, one by one. It can be done that way. And if anybody has any interest in joining us in that endeavor, you have a piece of paper in front of you, just let me know your name and your email address and I'll see that you get more information. Now, to close this off, it's pretty hard. We covered some real heavy stuff here. How do you close it off on a light note? Excuse me, how much time? Uh, this is about it. I'm closing now. No, less than that. <laughs> how do you close this off on a light note? <laughs> so to do that, <laughs> I'd like to go back to, uh, to that classroom to where the kitten was being looked at so carefully. And it reminded me of my Aunt Alice. My Aunt Alice was a wonderful woman. She raised me. She was sort of my surrogate father and mother. She was an old maid school teacher, aunt. Everyone loved her. And uh, she was a very wise lady and a wonderful lady. But one of the things that she did that always amazed everyone is that she could look at a young kitten and tell you whether it was going to grow up and be a male tomcat or a female cat. She could always do that. And everybody would say, Aunt Alice, how do you do that? And she'd laugh and say, well, uh, you just can do it. Many years later, she finally confided to me her secret. I call it the Aunt Alice formula. She said, Edward, it's very simple. Just look at the kittens, and after they're just a couple of weeks old, you can tell by looking at their heads. The ones that are starting to grow broad heads are the tomcats, and the ones with the little narrow heads are the female cats. That's simple as that. I said, is that all there is to it? She said, yeah. And by golly, I've been doing that ever since. I've amazed people by telling them whether it's going to be a tomcat or a female cat. And I'm usually right. So that's the Aunt Alice formula, and I want to close by mentioning that because it's an illustration of the fact that I don't care how complex and seemingly hopeless a problem may be, sometimes the solutions are more simple than you think. Thank you very much.